All right, so welcome to Eat, Move, Think, the show about optimal wellness brought to you by MyCan. Wow. Do it again. Do it again. Oh, I was practicing. Oh. <laughs> okay, ready? <clears throat> Welcome, welcome, welcome to Eat, Move, Think, Think, the show about optimal, optimal, optimal wellness brought, brought to you, you by Medcan. Yeah, that, this is extremely good. Thank you. Did you hear about this new study? We talk about a lot of studies on this podcast, which okay, specify. Yeah. <laughs> well, so it's about brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Basically, Gretchen Reynolds at the Washington Post, she called it miracle grow for the brain. BDNF, right? That's 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 what it's commonly known as. And it essentially helps the brain be healthy and grow new cells and then mature the cells that it currently has. And it's really important for cognition. Mm -hmm. And exercise is one of the few things that really seems to boost the levels of BDNF uh, in the body. And so in this new study, what really boosted levels of this fertilizer for the brain was high intensity interval training. So basically vigorous exercise. And in fact, they found that six minutes of vigorous exercise. So I think it was 40 seconds of all out cycling followed by 20 seconds of rest and then repeat for six minutes, Mm -hmm. increased levels of BDNF by four or five times, more than any other thing that the researchers studied. So six minutes, you're saying six minutes of vigorous exercise, so a HIIT workout is a great way to boost BDNF in the brain. Yeah, and that's associated with better cognition, better memory, a whole host of benefits, better long-term brain health over time. And it speaks to the close relationship between exercise and long-term brain health. And so that's what we're going to be exploring in this episode. We're talking to one of the world experts on brain health and exercise. Amazing. I'm Chris. I'm Jazz. We're the producers of Eat, Move, Think. Okay, that BDNF study was a small study. It was on 12 people. But also around the same time, one of the biggest studies ever on the relationship between exercise and cognition has come out. It was on 350,000 people. Whoa. The findings create one of the strongest arguments ever between exercise and long-term brain health. Basically like aging better, retaining your faculties Mm -hmm. for longer, you know, into your 70s, 80s, and beyond. So it'll be really interesting to learn how exactly it's affecting our brain. Like, what qualities are we are we boosting here? Focus, memory, intelligence. Like, what is improving and what's the timeline for that? Yeah, exactly. And are there better exercises to improve brain health than others? Totally. So in this episode, our MOVE host, Dr. Andrew Miners, is joined by Dr. Boris Chevelle. He's one of the lead authors on that new study. He's an author and senior researcher in health and exercise psychology at the University of Geneva. Dr. Andrew Miners and Dr. Chevelle are going to explore how your workouts may be changing your brain and improving your cognition over the long term. So to absorb the most information possible out of this podcast, you should probably go for a run or get moving at least while you listen. Yeah, go out for a walk. Here's Dr. Andrew Miner. This is Dr. Andrew Miners. Uh, Welcome back to another episode of Eat, Move, Think. This is a move episode, and I've got a really interesting topic today. We're talking about exercise and brain health. Now, we've had different conversations about this on the podcast around mental health, cognitive functioning, but this is a really unique new study that came out. And so I'm here with a very interesting person, Dr. Boris Cheval, who's a senior researcher in health and exercise psychology at the University of Geneva in Switzerland. So he's a PhD in exercise science. Welcome, Dr. Cheval, to Eat, Move, Think. Thank you. Welcome to having me. I'm really happy to be uh, to be here and to to discuss about uh, physical activity and uh, and health and cognitive function. Amazing. Thank you. You know, I always I didn't coin this term, but I use it all the time with patients because I, I I'm a clinician. I see patients, and it's you know, exercise is medicine. Um, and your research really is supporting that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. To get things started, I'd really like you to tell us about how you became interested in the connection between movement or exercise and the brain. Yeah, so actually, as you say, I did my uh, my research in uh, in sports science and mostly in uh, exercise psychology, so exercise motivation. So we're interested in understanding as a main factor that explains the engagement in physical activity. To do so, we have, of course, motivation, uh, attitude, a uh, lot of variables that are designed and conceptualized from a psychological perspective. But we also have cognitive function as a predictor. So this idea is that people with higher cognitive function will be more able to engage in physical activity. 
and especially because of something that eventually we can discuss, the idea that we are designed toward a form minimization and to counteract this tendency, we need cognitive function. So I hmm. had a look in the literature that uh, examined the, the link between physical activity and cognitive function. And actually, most of the literature are in one direction to assess how physical activity improve cognitive function. So I was really interested mm -hmm. in understanding the link between physical activity and cognitive function. So it comes from exercise psychology, exercise motivation to more a social epidemiology or epidemiology uh, approach. That's fascinating because as you said, there's lots of literature talking about physical activity and cognitive functioning, but the link of cognitive functioning back to physical activity, because they talk about this positive feedback loop that, you know, is it higher cognitive functioning leads to people doing more exercise? Or is it people that do more exercise have higher cognitive functioning? Or if you do more exercise, you have better cognitive functioning that makes you do more exercise and it's this positive feedback loop. Maybe it is that people with higher cognitive functioning exercise more. And so there's the benefit. But one of the quotes you had here, which, which really stood out to me is that, and this is a quote, cognitive functioning may be required to counteract the automatic attraction to effort minimalization. I love that quote, basically saying that humans are naturally lazy. <laughs> yeah, we are uh, naturally efficient. <laughs> efficient <laughs> to engage a lot of effort uh, to to do a lot of activity to reach some goal but we need to ensure that the effort are necessary and justified so yeah we minimize our effort it's normal from an evolutionary perspective so in the current modern environment with a lot of sedentary temptation and possibility we need our brain to counteract such tendency and in the lab we have evidence that avoiding sedentary opportunity is associated with higher inhibitory control, and we can assess this with, for example, uh, electroencephalography. So we have evidence that not going towards sedentary behavior is possible to do, but as inhibitory control. So more cognitive resources, more cognitive effort. Yeah. Wow. And so... You know, most of your paper, I didn't understand a lot of the genetics. So I think back to my second year in university, taking my, you know, my second year genetics class and thinking about Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn's peas, if I remember correctly, did genetic studies looking at peas and specific phenotypes that are expressed based on cross pollination as my, if I remember back yeah. 20 years ago. But why don't we start at the beginning? Where did this link between physical activity and brain function start? Like where, where was this first noticed? How did this start? Yeah, so uh, a few decades ago, especially in animal study, researchers observed that rodents that are the more active actually have better performance in cognitive tests or intelligent tests. So there was really a, a behavioral observation that higher activity lead or associate at least to higher cognitive performance in rodent. Hmm. And then, because in animal, we can sacrifice the animal. So they sacrifice the animal and look at the brain tissue and observe that there are a specific change also in the brain tissue, especially related to uh, a protein, which is called BDNF for brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is a protein that have been evolved and know it's, it's well known to change and improve neural process. So neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, angiogenesis, so a lot of positive change in the brain that is uh, because of this uh, BDNF molecule. So in, when we look at this animal, we have this evidence. Mm -hmm. And then the idea was to go from animal to human. And in human, we also observe if you took a random sample of individual worldwide, you just assess their cognitive performance and their physical activity level. And there will be a strong correlation between physical activity and cognitive function. Okay. So we don't know if physical activity cause cognitive function or cognitive function cause physical activity, but at least both are strongly correlated. And from an epidemiological viewpoint, we also have a mechanicist explanation. So we have a biological explanation for the link from physical activity to cognitive function, because when you engage in physical activity, you have a lot of change. Uh, in your body, you have a, a strong homeostatic dysregulation, mm -hmm. the release of hormones, the release of proteins that have been found, like BDNF. Mm -hmm. So we have both association and we have also uh, a biological explanation of this association. So from an epidemiological viewpoint, we are really good wow. uh, regarding the, the association and the explanation. Cool. So we know that exercise does stuff. Right. As you said, this biologic response increases brain derived neurotrophic factor, the BDNF, that causes our brain to basically 
improve by growing angiogenesis, neurogenesis, uh, increasing synaptic activity, causing plasticity within the brain, which you know our listeners have heard about neuroplasticity before. So exercise increases this hormone and causes changes. So that leads to this research paper that you did. And now my understanding is the first of its kind linking genetics yeah. as a way to sort of tease out whether it's cognitive function leading to increased physical activity or whether it's physical activity leading to cognitive functioning. Now, your study was complex, so please do your best to try to explain it to me so I can understand it. <laughs> yes, so it's, the basic idea is relatively easy. In experimental psychology, we need to have uh, the gold standard evidence of causality randomized control triad. This means that you have to prove that something causes something else. Yeah. So right. you have you have some participant who you randomize participant in either the experimental condition or the condition. So it's a random mm -hmm. control triage that you produce. The good things with Mendeleyan randomization is that we are all in a random control trial. Mendeleyan randomization can be called a random control trial of modern nature because everybody at start have a random genetic variation at birth. Right. So meaning at a birth, you may have a gene or not have a gene, and Mother Nature is random already. Yeah. Okay. So for example, if we think about physical activity at birth, some people have some genes that are more related to physical activity. Right. So they're more likely to engage in physical activity or have a promotion towards that. And for example, in our study, there is a 15% that are related to physical activity that is explained by the gen, the genes. Okay. And we also have the same variation in gen for cognitive function. So we use these genes that are identified to be related to physical activity as a random exposure. Right. This is a random exposure. We have random genes that are randomly related to physical activity. Right. Some will have it, some will don't. Yeah, like if you are in experimental or controlled condition. Mm -hmm. So then we use this variable that are not related at birth to cognitive function to examine if this variable, which is now called an instrumental variable, are related to cognitive function later in life. Okay. And if we have an association, and if there is also some statistical assumption to, to be made, but if everything is made and you have this assumption, you can consider that you have a potential causal link between physical activity and cognitive function. Okay. So it's the way to have preliminary evidence of causality in observational longitudinal data set. You do not need to rely on experimental random control triad. Gotcha. I think I understand. So let me try to relate that back. So some people have the gene for physical activity. Yeah. Some don't. Some will have the gene for increased cognitive functioning. Some don't. Yeah. And some may not have either, right? And so that's where the randomization comes. So you take 100 people, some will have, some won't. Yeah. So when you introduce another variable, you can assume that if you see that variable have an impact, it's not related to that gene. So if you have the gene for physical activity and they increase their physical activity, you could say it's related to that gene. But if someone doesn't have the gene and they increase their physical activity, it's related to the physical activity, especially if that physical activity causes another outcome like increased cognitive functioning. Is that right? Yeah, you, are, you have the first step, it's, which is called genome-wide association studies. So you identify genes related to your physical activity or your cognitive function. Mm -hmm. Use these identified genes as an instrumental variable in your model. So you try to see if this gene variation are related to cognitive function. Okay. And if you found this association, this means that physical activity variation, the random exposition to the gene related to physical activity mm -hmm. can potentially cause cognitive function. And you can do the same in the reverse. You have the gene for cognitive function and you can assess if this gene, this variation in gene, are related to physical activity, which was not the case in our study, unfortunately, for that direction. So that's interesting. So you're using genes to get control to find out if, if it has an impact. So you use this Mendelian randomization, which is probably named after the P's, right? It's the same guy named after the P's because you're looking at specific phenotypes or genetic expression leading to something. Yeah. So what did your study find? So we find that people who engage in moderate or vigorous physical activity had a better cognitive function relative to people that engage less in moderate and, and vigorous physical activity. How many people are you talking here? 350,000 people. Wow, that's a lot. So we have these two large-scale studies that we, we put together. And with this large-scale study, with the Mendeleyan randomization, we observe a unidirectional link from physical activity, either moderate and vigorous, toward cognitive function. However, we did not observe the reverse association. So in this data set, cognitive function do not cause higher physical activity. We have not the reverse association. Interesting. 
Because that was one of the arguments in the literature, right? It was that what does what, right? They're an association, but is it cognitive function that creates physical activity or physical activity that improves cognitive functioning? So you found in your study, especially using the genetic control, is that physical activity does lead to increased cognitive functioning, but cognitive function doesn't lead necessarily to increase physical activity. Is that right? Yes, in our study, yes. And this is the first study to say that, is my understanding. Yeah, so there are other observational studies, uh, including own work, that show that there is a, a temporal precedent between physical activity and cognitive function that observes a bidirectional association. Mm -hmm. But this is the first study, uh, a large study like that, with a, the use of genetic to assess potential bidirectional and causal link between a physical activity and cognitive function, yeah. Wow, fascinating. And, you know, I was reading through your paper and you referenced some other studies that had smaller sample sizes. So this is also like 350 subjects yeah. is, is a huge sample size compared to say, you know, yeah. a couple of dozen maybe or upwards of 100 in some studies compared to 350,000. Yeah, yeah. And that means that the more likely you can actually apply it to the general population because it has statistical power, right? The ability to infer assumptions on the greater population because you've got high statistical power. Now, a couple of things I want to get into next. I always say to patients, you know, any exercise is good exercise. And in fact, we did a podcast not long ago, we're talking about how do you go from, you know, nothing to something in terms of just general physical activity and just how even a little bit of activity can increase your physical benefit. But your study, one, looked at average physical activity and then looked at moderate to vigorous physical activity. And what you found was the association that we just talked about was only found in moderate to vigorous physical activity, not in average daily activity. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the average physical activity, we, we also have sedentary behavior. So it is an overall movement. So this is why there is a dilution of the effect. We did not assess light activity, for example. Right. But it's true that in our study, at least moderate is, is needed to have the effect. But we, we can also look at only light, but it was not the case here. And the overall average includes sedentary behavior within it, so it's normal that there is no overall effect. Right, so exercise is still good for you. Even if you're just getting started, going from nothing to something, that doing some exercise is still better than nothing, but your study specifically looked at moderate to vigorous, yeah. and that does, in fact, create a positive benefit in terms of improving cognitive function. Yeah. But not to say that being active in general doesn't. Yeah. But it's also important to stress that every step counts mm -hmm. because as soon as you, you start working, you, you have a decrease in your risk of mortality. Yeah, all cause mortality. For yeah. cognitive function, eventually we need uh, enough intensity and eventually we can come back to that later, but all activities are not equal. If you are doing some uh, jogging or running in front of a computer, for example, mm -hmm. or just the activity versus if you are doing dancing, that is, you are doing movement, you learn something. Mm -hmm. If the activity is of moderate intensity and if it's the activity is cognitively challenging, the effect could be relatively higher. Interesting. And we can also discuss where the activity takes place because there are some evidence showing that physical activity outside, especially outside when you are uh, around green or blue space, mm -hmm. increase cognitive benefit. So there is this general idea that based on the cardiovascular fitness hypothesis that higher fitness you have, the better your cognitive function be, but you can eventually optimize the type of physical activities that you do to improve your cognitive function. And one of my colleagues in the US mm -hmm. is actually working on a program in which he has participants to do some physical activity and at the same time, to do some uh, connective uh, training activity. Yeah. And this is idea, it's called, so it's David Reclaim from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And this idea is that there will be an interactive effect between the physical activity and the cognitive challenge. Hmm. So in our study, we did not look at this because we have not the uh, specificity of the measure, Yeah, but we also have, may have additional interactive effect uh, depending on the type of physical activity people are doing. Amazing. So <clears throat> what I took from that, and I'm going to extrapolate this to a big leap here, is if you're looking at the ultimate exercise, you should be doing moderate to vigorous activity outside, listening to music you like with a friend near green space and doing Sudoku at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which would be hard to prove that, but a lot of variables there. But that's that's sort of what we're saying is challenging your mind, challenging your body, do it in green space, do it with a friend and listen to music has all been shown to have individual impacts on health. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. 
Now, I'm going to get into some other stuff here. Uh, thank you, Boris. You talked about, in your study, cognitive functioning, right? Improvement in cognitive function. How did you define improvement in cognitive function? Because there's research that looks at exercises improving mental health around reducing depression and even being used as a treatment for depression, even when they're non-responsive to medications. Uh, we see that exercise is helpful for anxiety, yeah. right, in terms of reducing uh, generalized anxiety disorder. How did you define cognitive functioning? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's a difficult question. To define but here it's a general cognitive functioning so it's a general ability to interact with the environment but there are a lot of sub parts for example working memory executive function selective attention so a lot of parts that are organized toward a general mm -hmm. cognitive functioning so it's difficult to define this term but i think you can consider that this is the ability to interact okay. how you will be able to manage handle uh, and to be flexible in front of uh, an environment with specific uh, characteristics. So I think we can define like that. Yeah. Okay. That makes me think of an old coach I had. I played football. I had an old coach that said, be flexible and have a sense of humor. And so basically this might be when we talk about cognitive functioning is ability to be mentally flexible and yeah. to be, have a positive outlook on your engagement with the environment. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Now there's also studies that look at potentially using exercise as a means to mitigate or delay or modulate the effects of cognitive decline with age, such as Alzheimer's and, and, you know, brain related decline disease. Does your research have an impact on that? We have some uh, hypotheses about the role of physical activity and cognitive function, of course. But mm -hmm. when we look at the epidemiological data, it's true that people more active have a reduction in the risk of Alzheimer's disease of dementia. So at the epidemiological level, physical activity, also sleep, right. may have an influence on the probability to have a dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So, yeah, at the epidemiological level, we have evidence that more active people will retard their decline in, in cognitive function. So yeah, we have this evidence. Again, is there a causality? It's, it's always difficult with observational data, mm -hmm. but physical activity is highly protective from the cognitive decline. And we also have the same thing. If we look at children within school, mm. improving physical activity during school is associated with an improvement, for example, on, on math mathematic performance. Hmm. So uh, there is evidence that moving can improve also cognitive performance, at least school achievement in mathematics in children. So we have an effect of physical activity that should be clear across all the life course. So you will benefit from physical activity mm -hmm. if you are a child, if you are a young adult, food, or if you are an uh, older adult. But it's true that during aging, we know that there is a huge increase in dementia. Uh, this is really costly also for uh, the society. Mm -hmm. And physical activity and non-pharmacological intervention are a lot of possibility, I think. Yeah. You know, based on your study and this brain-derived neurotrophic factor... Do you think that that might be what's explaining what's happening? You know, even if you can increase this positive growth factor in an op-ed piece, I think from the Washington Post, they called it miracle grow for the brain. At least if we look at the evolution of BDNF across age, there is a decrease in BDNF. As you get older, you have less BDNF. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's, it's really parallel to the declining cognitive function. Mm -hmm. So we can expect that indeed uh, by doing physical activity, by changing the quantity, the concentration of BDNF that you have across your, your life, this may be an explanation of, of why uh, your brain maintains this activity, this structure, this connection. So yeah, it could be an explanation. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And then, you know, one of the things, you know, when we talked about in that previous podcast with, with Dr. Nelson Ferreira was... He talked about when he did start walking to work in the morning, he felt better throughout the day, felt more alert, more engaged, more mentally aware. Is that also related to the BDNF, do you think? Yeah. So there are two types of exercise that we have to distinguish. The acute mm -hmm. effect of exercise. So when you engage in activity, what are the acute effect and the chronic effect? Right. So if we look at the acute effect, there is some evidence showing that if you do some physical activity... And then you have a learning or memory task, you will perform better okay. if it's moderate activity and not vigorous. Okay. The idea behind is based on BDNF and also the endocannabinoid system. Okay, gotcha. So yeah, actually data are consistent with this idea that moderate exercise may have acute positive effect on learning or memory task. Yeah. Interesting. And, you know, for our listeners, I think generally when we talk about practical application, we say, well, what is moderate to vigorous activity? We talk about moderate kind of being the ability to walk and being short of breath. You can carry on a conversation, but it's difficult. You have, you're, you're breathing hard. You can't have a nice, calm conversation like we're having right now. 
And then vigorous activity, meaning when your heart rate is significantly elevated, and you probably can't carry on an, on a conversation because you're breathing too heavily. Is, is that is that accurate? That's perfect. I mean, uh, we always use this uh, information about respiration. Yeah, I think it's the most accurate and explicit indicator of the, the respiration. Yeah. yeah. Kind of call it a talk test. <laughs> of whether you can talk or not talk or how difficult it is to talk. That's fascinating. So you did correlate in your study physical activity to cognitive functioning. We didn't look at light physical activity per se. We looked at moderate to vigorous. In your study, what did you use to track physical activity? Yeah, it's a device that you put uh, on you that assess all your movement. Mm -hmm. There are some discussion about the accuracy to determine the intensity, but they are vali validated procedure. Right. It's measuring movement as opposed to just having someone say they're moving. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. You know, one of the biggest interesting things about your study, apart from everything we've already talked about, is how genetics impacts your life. And you looked at whether you have this gene for physical activity or cognitive functioning, but that even if you don't have the gene, you can still benefit. Is that right? So it's not that if you don't have the gene, don't exercise because it won't help you. How much does genetics play a role in our benefits with exercise? So it's really dependent on the outcome on the exposure, but it's really important to understand that there is a gene and there is then the, or the genome and there is the exposome. So everything that is not related to genome can clearly change also the expression of your genome, so which is called epigenetics. So Whether you turn it on or off. Yeah, so, so it's really right. important to understand that gene predisposed to, to nothing because environment will interact. Uh, okay. And there are some right. people that have some uh, susceptibility. For example, some people will smoke and will develop a cancer, other not. Mm -hmm. Because there is a genetic susceptibility that may moderate the impact of environment on your health. Ah, I see. We have some people that are more predisposed to have issues related to cognitive function. And in the effect of physical activity on cognitive function, they had identified a specific genes, which is called APOE, the LL4 or the APOE genes, and people who have this LL4, uh, the benefit of physical activity on the cognitive function is higher than for the other. Okay. Everybody benefits, but somebody can benefit. Benefit more. I think in research, you call that responders, non-responders, and middle responders. Is that right? Or is that that same idea? That's the same idea. And we have also the same for the endocannabinoid system. Mm -hmm. So some people will experience a runner's high. Yeah, like the endorphin response, the cannabinoid response that you get this high, you feel good after. And some we will not have this possibility or less possibility. So th there is a, an interaction between environment and, and genome. Yeah, always. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. At MedCan, we have a quite a great uh, genetics program we, we do with master's level kind of genetic counselors that we have somewhere you sit down with you and go over it on actionable things and making sure you understand what your genetic results mean. And I, I did one not long ago, and it was kind of like an athletic assessment kind of. We have pharmacogenomics, general genome sequencing. And basically what it said, one of the results that I found interesting was that it said that I wasn't genetically predisposed to sort of muscular strength. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. But I, you know, I played professional football and I worked out like a madman and I was pretty strong in my day. And I'm like, you know, I, when I say professional football, I played professional football in a semi-pro league in Europe. So not really like NFL or CFL or anything like that. But I'm like, maybe if I had that gene, I could have. <laughs> so meaning I did pretty good despite not having the gene. And what I'm getting at is exercising is still good to do. And you might be a high responder, meaning you might have really positive benefits, but you're still going to have benefits. Yeah, that, that's important to, to stress that everybody will benefit. Yeah. And if you are totally physically inactive across your whole life, it's never too late to engage because other studies show that you will have the benefits of physical activity, even if you were not physically active across your life before. So yeah, it's really important to engage. Although we can discuss, but the health benefits is not enough to promote the motivation to engage across your life. If yeah, you did not enjoy physical activity, this is absolutely not possible uh, to maintain physical activity. So, for example, mm. here we discuss the impact of physical activity on depression and longevity and cognitive function. Yeah, that's right. But for a, a perspective of motivation and promoting physical activity, there is no specific influence of such information. We need to ensure that people will enjoy the physical activity to be sure that they will maintain and develop habits toward physical activity across their life. Interesting. Based on your psychology background, I'd like to learn more about that. So people are, are kind of like electricity. We find the path of least resistance, right? So if you have people that haven't enjoyed physical activity, based on your background, research and experience, what are some things that we know to help to change those people that are unmotivated to being motivated? Yeah. So... 
if we think about the decision to engage in activity, you have a choice to engage in activity or to stay in your sofa. Mm -hmm. So you have to consider that the health benefit is for in multiple decades, in two decades or three decades or four decades. So in terms of brain activity, there is delayed discounting of the reward. Meaning like, I know I won't die today, but I know that it'll help me in the future, but the future so far away, I'm not focused on it. Yeah, and the other element to consider is that you engage in activity, which is sure is that this will be associated with a lot of effort. Right. So when you have to decide between a sedentary activity, which is directly pleasurable to just stay on your sofa and watching TV, against an activity that will provide long-term benefits on, but also effort, right. in that specific circumstance, your brain will automatically choose the sedentary activity. Interesting. So the way to reweight this balance between sedentary and physical activity is to add something immediately rewarding when you engage in physical activity. So if you dislike physical activity, there is no possibility that you engage in the long term. And we show this with patients. So you need to find a carrot, right? Because exercise is arguably the stick, <laughs> right? Because it's uncomfortable. It can sometimes cause soreness or discomfort and you sweat and it's all that kind of stuff. It takes effort. So how do you do that from a psychological perspective with someone to give them a carrot? Yeah, we have a lot of possibility to change your exercise routine. So for example, yeah. with some colleagues in the US, we just change the workout in terms of when the higher intensity will be done during the exercise session. So we either have a protocol in which the intensity increase across the session and another okay. experimental group in which the intensity of the effort decrease across the exercise session. And we show that people that have the decreased effort have a better remembered pleasure of their exercise session and are more willing huh. to engage again. So if we ended correctly the exercise session, this would be better. So we have, hmm. we have to take care about a happy end in exercise, for example. Happy endings. Like but it. could be very useful. You can also add music, mm -hmm. improve effective response. And you also have to be aware that if you are doing high-intensity exercise, you will have a negative affective response. So it's, it's always important to consider that the HIT, the new way to promote exercise. Yeah, the HIT training. Yeah. In terms of affective experience, this is not the, the good way to do, or at least uh -huh. not on the exercise session with this. So a lot of possibility to have an exercise session that includes psychological consideration to improve either the affective experience during the whole session or at least at the end of the exercise session. Interesting. So in the short term, to try to get someone who's sedentary to being active, right, there has to be a conscious decision. But the way to try to encourage that conscious decision is to try to make it more pleasurable, yeah. in essence, right? To make it go walk with a friend, listen to music, maybe watch your favorite TV show while you're sitting on a bike and, and circling your legs. And then as you become more experienced, maybe, again, doing the harder stuff at the beginning of your exercise and finishing off with maybe a pleasurable stretching or mindfulness-based thing or listening to music or a massage or something like that or a reward yourself with a, with a nice tasty smoothie at the end where you get that positive effect at the end. Do you think that links with it from a psychology perspective? We talk about cognitive behavioral therapy and using basic or cognition to override behavior. And so saying, hey, I'm going to feel better after. This is going to feel great. Trying to positive self-talk. Yeah, self-talk could be uh, is also in the psychological tips that we, we add in our book hmm. to engage in physical activity. Self-talk could be useful to reduce the effort and to uh, improve the affective experience. So this could be this could be used. Yeah, yeah. Now, you mentioned your book. Le syndrome de Parousseau. Did I ha you, have, you better say that in French for me because my pronunciation is horrible in French. Le, le syndrome du paresseux. Excellent, which is the lazy syndrome translated. Tell us about your book. Give us, give us a synopsis of your book. Yeah, so the, the overall idea of the book was to explain uh, why people have the intention to exercise. We have more than 90% of the population that have the intention. Mm -hmm. Do people really engage across the life course? And to understand that gap, we rely on a, a dual process model theory that suggests that you have two systems that explain your behavior. You have a rational system, the intention, the attitude, the willingness to engage, and you may have the intention to exercise. But in the same time, if you feel bad when you are engaging in physical activity, your automatic system will push you away from the exercise. Hmm. Both the reflective system and also the automatic system are both going in the same direction. So our idea was to so ensure intention, which is the case, people have the intention, but then to ensure that the automatic system, automatic pathway will be positive for, for exercise. Hmm. And of course, 
the idea of effort minimization to so really this idea that we are designed like like other animals to avoid unnecessary physical exertion so if we have other possibility to reach the goal by minimizing the effort we will do it this is normal this is a way to reach your goal with the minimization of effort and this is really effective in terms of evolution so currently this is really bad for our health but for our ancestors it would be a, a good choice to do so yeah that reminds me, I had a conversation with my daughter just last night. So my daughter's just about to turn 14. She plays uh, volleyball and equestrian. But uh, she came in, we were on our way home from school. And she's like, Dad, I'm going to work out tonight. So I'm, I'm going to do a workout tonight. And I'm like, okay, good. And she goes, so I want you to leave the living room because the only way I can do it is in the living room and I don't want you there when I do it. I'm like, okay, fine, I'll leave for you. And anyway, so it comes around 9 o'clock at night and she's got her workout stuff on. So she, she's put it on and then she's like, I don't know if I'm going to. And so she starts having this, you can see it in her mind and she's like, Maybe I'll just have a nice warm shower. And so ultimately, she decided to skip the workout and had the nice warm shower instead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Went to pleasure and not pain. <laughs> this point of decision between uh, what we want and what our body feels. For decades, emotions are considered as something negative that, that disturb your cognitive decision. But currently in psychology, affect and emotion are considered essential to help people take decisions. So no emotion are considered as both a negative element, but also a positive one. So emotion need to be integrated with the, the cognitive predictor. So both cognitive process, but also affective ones need to be considered to understand and explain how or behavior. Amazing. This has been a great conversation, uh, Boris. I've really appreciated it and learned a lot. What I've learned is your research is just reinforcing that exercise is good for you. Exercise is medicine and you need to exercise the body, but also sort of the last part of our conversation, you need to exercise your mind too with positive self-talk and that engaging in exercise is as much a mental endeavor as it is a physical endeavor and that we're ongoing on research moving forward, learning more and more about the brain and how exercise plays a role in that. Thank you so much, Dr. Cheval, for joining us all the way from Switzerland. I really appreciated chatting with you and thank you for your paper. It really adds something to the body of research. So thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. That was Dr. Andrew Miners, MedChem's Clinical and Product Director of Sports Medicine, Therapy, Rehabilitation, and Fitness, in conversation with Dr. Boris Cheval, Senior Researcher in Health and Exercise Psychology at the University of Geneva, as well as a lead author of the study they talked about in this episode. To book a consultation with a MedCan personal trainer, email fitness at medcan.com. Follow MedCan on Twitter and Instagram at MedCanLiveWell, and follow Dr. Boris Cheval on Twitter at Cheval Boris, that's C-H-E-V-A-L-B-O-R-I-S. We'll post episode highlights and other links you can visit on our website, Eat Move Podcast.com. Say hello and send us a tip or a suggestion by emailing us at info at eatmovethinkpodcast.com. Eat Move Think is produced by Ghost Bureau, Jasmine Ratch is managing producer, social media and strategy support is from Chantel Gertan, Andrew Imex, and Emily Bozik. As well as Amanda Serafina James and Naman Duta. And I'm executive producer Christopher Shulgin. We'll be back soon with another episode examining the latest in health and wellness. This podcast episode is intended to provide general information about health and wellness only and is not designed or intended to constitute or be used as a substitute for medical advice, treatment, or diagnosis. You should always talk to your MedCan healthcare provider for individual medical advice, diagnosis, and treatment, including your specific health and wellness needs. This podcast is based on the information available at the time of preparation and is only accurate and current as of that date. Source information and recommendations are subject to change based on scientific evidence as it evolves over time. MedCan is not responsible for future changes or updates updates to the information and recommendations and assumes no obligation to update based on future developments. Reference to or mention of specific treatments or therapies does not constitute or imply a recommendation or endorsement. The links provided within the associated document are to assist the reader with any specific information highlighted. Any third-party links are not endorsed by MedCan.